This is a first reconstruction of the skull of one of our remote ancestors, found in fragments in East Africa by one of the famous Leakey team in 1972. This primitive skull is perhaps three million years old. It is a real missing link in human evolution. A modern discovery like this is subjected to a powerful array of scientific tests. Here, for example, in a Cambridge laboratory, samples of the rock beds in which it was found are being accurately dated by an advanced physical method. Thanks to methods of investigation like these, applied over the whole range of natural sciences, a vast amount of objective data is soon available on any modern find in this field. Seventy years ago, things were very different. Seventy years ago, in a laboratory setting far removed from that of the Department of Geodesy and Geophysics in Cambridge, it was possible for some person or persons unknown to embark on an elaborate piece of forgery in the field of human evolution. And because the scientific tests of today were then not available, it was possible for them to get away with it. Around the turn of the century, or a little later, Someone got hold of some pieces of an unusually thick human skull and set about staining them in various chemical brews. One of the treatments involved boiling these skull fragments in an iron sulphate solution. The same person, or persons unknown, also obtained the jaw of an orangutan. The orang is one of the great apes and lives in the jungles of the Far East. The specimen in question was more or less a modern one, perhaps a few hundred years old, certainly not a fossil. Our forger or forgers went about removing all the most distinctly ape-like features of this jaw, like the region of its chin and the knob that hinges the jaw onto the skull. These features would have told a competent anatomist immediately that he was dealing with the jaw of an ape so would the teeth that remained in the jaw. These teeth were filed right down so that the ape cusps were completely removed and a much more human looking state of wear was obtained. After all these modifications had been carried out, the orang jaw too was stained in various chemical solutions. Some bogus flint tools of a very primitive looking sort were made and likewise stained and added to the forger's growing collection. The fraudulent assemblage was rounded off with a careful selection of old animal bones, some of them genuine fossils of great antiquity from various foreign sites. The whole bag of tricks was stewed up to a consistent colouring. Why were all these things being done? What was it that the forger or forgers were trying to make? They were trying to make the missing link I was walking along a farm road close to Piltdown Common when I noticed that the road had been mended with some peculiar brown flints not usual in the district. Upon inquiry, I was astonished to learn that they were dug from a gravel bed on the farm. And shortly afterwards, I visited the place where two labourers were at work digging the gravel for small repairs to the road. I asked the workmen if they'd found bones or other fossils there. I urged them to preserve anything that they might find. These are the words of Charles Dawson, the lawyer antiquarian of Uckfield in Sussex. One of his professional duties brought him roughly every four years the short distance from Uckfield to the Piltdown area, where he was steward of the manor of Barkham and where he presided over the local court baron. We do not know in which year Mr. Dawson alerted the workmen to the possibility of any fines in their gravel pit. It may have been 1889, 1904 or 1907. The date of the next move is not quite so vague. It was probably in 1908. Upon one of my subsequent visits to the pit, 
one of the men handed to me a small portion of an unusually thick human parietal bone. A piece of the side wall of a skull. I immediately made a search, but could find nothing more. Nor had the men noticed anything else. In fact, the bed seemed to be quite unfossiliferous. The gravel diggings by the side of the road are grassed over now. The actual finds were made roughly where the hedge now runs. It was not until some years later, in the autumn of 1911, on a subsequent visit to the spot, that I picked up, among the rain-washed spoil heaps of the gravel pit, another and larger piece. One of those who saw a piece of the skull around this time was the young Teilhard de Chardin. He had been at the Jesuit seminary in Hastings since 1909 and had met Charles Dawson in the course of fossil hunting. The jeweller and fanatical amateur archaeologist Lewis Abbott also saw the pieces. He even implied in later years that he'd had them in his possession at one stage and had helped Dawson to treat them in some sort of preserving chemicals. The first thing from Piltdown to come to the attention of the scientific establishment was this fossil tooth of an ancient form of hippopotamus. Dawson sent it in March 1911 to an old friend in the British Museum, Arthur Smith Woodward, asking him to confirm its identification, which proved to be correct. Sir Arthur was keeper of the Department of Geology at South Kensington. Smith Woodward had vaguely known about Dawson's skull fragments for about a month when he got the hippo tooth in March 1911. He knew that Dawson regarded the gravel bed at Piltdown as very old, having been deposited by the Sussex Ooze at a time when it flowed at a much higher level across the countryside. Now this hippo tooth seemed to confirm that the gravel belonged to the very beginning of the Ice Age, maybe up to a million years ago. Dawson and Woodward wanted to visit the site together as soon as possible, but bad weather, flooding at Piltdown, and Woodward's work delayed them. Eventually, Dawson brought his bits and pieces to London. He was very proud of his thick fragments of human skull, and Smith Woodward was impressed. Dawson and Woodward, together with Teilhard de Chardin, a local workman, and a goose, began digging at the Piltdown pit on Saturday, June the 2nd, 1912. Unfortunately, no real plans were drawn, and no photograph records the finding of any object, but many new and startling finds were made. Arthur Smith Woodward personally recovered some more fragments of the thick human skull, so that now, in addition to Dawson's original pieces, five new pieces of the same thick skull were available, making nine in all. A rough reconstruction of the Piltdown skull was now possible. There were side pieces, pieces from the back, there was a fragment of the eye socket and brow, and a fragment from the region of the temple. These four pieces belonged to the left side of the skull. The new pieces found by Dr. Smith Woodward belonged to the right-hand side. They were plainly part of the same skull, all had the same thickness of bone, which Dawson thought a primitive feature. There were other finds. Teilhard de Chardin found this piece of tooth belonging to an extinct form of elephant. Some crudely worked flint tools turned up. They did not belong to any of the recognized forms of ancient stone implements. They were, for the most part, very primitive. This one, which was also found by Teilhard de Chardin, is one of the better examples. One day in the June of 1912, we do not know which day, there came flying out of the gravel as they dug this remarkable jaw. We do know that Dawson and Smith Woodward were digging alone when this discovery was made. So that now there was this strange jaw to add to the thick human skull. In December 1912, 
the fruits of the Piltdown Gravel Pit were gloriously announced to the Geological Society of London in their old meeting room in Burlington House. And shortly afterwards, under the prophetic eye of Charles Darwin, a group portrait was painted of the men associated with the discovery and scientific investigation of the Piltdown remains. Dawson and Smith Woodward gaze proudly upon their missing link. Only Théard de Chardin, who had returned to France, is absent. At the meeting of December 1912, Smith Woodward put forward his own interpretation of the Piltdown evidence. He took the view that the thick skull pieces and the jaw all came from the same creature. True, the jaw was very ape-like, except for its teeth, which Smith Woodward said were nothing like an ape's and much more like a man's. Unfortunately, the parts of the jaw were broken off, which would have settled whether it hinged upon a human or an ape skull. An ape's jaw can really only move up and down, and the shape of the hinge knob reflects this limitation. Whereas a human jaw can chew from side to side as well, and the knob is shaped so as to articulate in this way. If the Piltdown jaw belonged to the Piltdown skull, the knob should be shaped like a human one. But of course, it was missing. If you took Smith Woodward's line, then you had a sort of human being, blessed with a noble brain, but still lagging behind a bit in the refinement of his jaw. The crudely worked flints from Piltdown were just what you could expect from this ape man, and the bones of the animals with whom he had shared his world showed that he lived long enough ago to be an ape man. Smith Woodward's view was accepted by most people at the meeting, and Eoanthropus Dorsoni was christened that day at the Geological Society. At that meeting in 1912, and on the Society's visit to Piltdown soon afterwards, was 84-year-old Mr. George Sweeting. We stood there almost in awe and uh, perhaps reverent, reverence to think that we were at the spot where early man, uh, perhaps the earliest man of all time, including those uh, remains found in Africa and elsewhere, but uh, it was um, a, such a solemn occasion that you almost th thought you were attending a funeral service. Uh, at the end of the uh, discussion and uh, the questioning that took place, uh, we took a number of us, at any rate, took, a number, uh, took several samples of the uh, material, the gravel and sands from which the skull had been unearthed, uh, took them away and uh, they were kept, I think, for quite a number of years. Even I kept mine for a considerable time. Newspapers and magazines of the day took up Piltdown Man with relish and vied with one another in imaginative reconstructions. Interest in the earliest Englishman was worldwide. Their reporting was, as is usual in these matters, not altogether accurate. The prejudices of the day got an airing. Nothing wrong was seen in inviting the reader to compare this faked-up orang's jaw with the jaw of a Kaffir from southern Africa. Note the weakly developed chin. The other major prejudice was exploited too. To understand why the Piltdown man, or woman, was so gleefully received by both science and the lay public we need to look back a little into the history of anthropology. For most people in the early 19th century, including scholars, the biblical account of creation remained unquestionably true. The world had been created in 4004 BC. But the fieldwork of men like William Smith, done in the early years of the century, gradually revealed in the stratified record of the rocks that the earth had passed through many different geological epochs it must be, therefore, much older than the biblical calculations allowed. In France, Georges Cuvier sought a compromise between geology and the Bible. 
he concluded that there had been several distinct creations before Genesis. You might find the fossil remains of these previous creations, but Cuvier was certain you would never find any trace of man in the record of the rocks. In England, a country gentleman named John Freer did just that. Twelve feet down, and among the bones of extinct animals, he found some flint implements, which prompted him to observe, the situation in which these weapons were found may tempt us to refer them to a very remote period indeed, even beyond that of the present world. Freer's sensible observations were ahead of their time. Another Frenchman, Boucher de Pert, was the man whose patient efforts finally established the real antiquity of man. In the stratified gravels of the ancient watercourse of the Somme, Boucher turned up literally hundreds of man-made flint implements. His abundant finds in these ancient gravels demonstrated that man had indeed lived in remote geological epochs. The work of two Englishmen in the middle of the 19th century finally stabilised the picture of man's antiquity. Charles Lyell vastly extended the geological estimate of the age of the earth. He insisted that the long record of the rocks could be explained only in terms of the slow natural processes we observe in the world today. And Charles Darwin argued for a similar explanation of the world of living things. He showed how they too could be the result of a long, slow process of natural change. In the 1870s, a German disciple of Darwin's was able to picture the evolution of man himself. The story of human evolution begins with the amoeba. Little blobs of protoplasm floating in the primordial ocean millions of years ago. The next stage is represented by the emergence of the tunicates, of which the sea squirt is the modern example. In adulthood, the sea squirt is firmly anchored to the rock, but the larval stage swims free and has the beginning of a backbone. After the epoch of the fishes, the first amphibians began to colonize the land leading to the era of the giant reptiles and the famous dinosaurs. Among the reptiles, the first primitive mammals eventually emerged. The egg-lying duck-built platypus, for example. Then we have the early primates, the prosimians, like the lorises and the lemurs, with their development of binocular vision and the opposable thumb. After that, the great apes, the gibbons, orangs, and gorillas, and among them our own ape ancestors. Next comes the ape man himself, Pithecanthropus, which means ape man, the missing link. And he leads on to true humanity, here represented by one of its lowliest examples, the modern Papuan. It was the ape man that everyone was interested in. His actual physical remains had never been identified. On the one hand, we had the modern races of man, and on the other, the great apes and tribes of monkeys. But the fossil remains of the ape man link were still missing. The missing link was a plausible, but elusive hypothesis whose precise features could only be guessed at. Meanwhile, the evidence of his handiwork in the form of flint axes was cropping up in great abundance, if only his bones would turn up among them. Ironically, in 1856, three years before the publication of Origin of Species, a skull cap had come to light in Germany which really did belong to an earlier type of man, the famous Neanderthal man. But he was not recognised for what he was. In time, more and more of his remains were discovered, but by then it was obvious that he was too recent and too like ourselves to qualify as a missing link. In the Somme gravels, Boucher de Pert thought that he'd at last come across a very ancient jaw. Unfortunately, three Englishmen were able to prove, partly by chemical tests, that he'd been the innocent victim of a hoax. The jaw was not a fossil at all, but a modern bone. 
What was at that time genuinely the oldest and most primitive form of man discovered was unearthed in Java in the 1890s by a Dutchman. Again, neither the great age nor the true evolutionary character of these remains were recognised. Even their discoverer came to doubt them and locked them away from all inspection. 1907 saw the find of a human fossil that really did impress the students of human evolution. It was an ancient human jaw from a place called Mauer, near Heidelberg in Germany. Its most noticeable feature was that it was very massively made, and it was evidently very old. So, there you have the state of affairs in the years before Piltdown Man. The only real candidate for the role of remote human ancestor was the solitary massive jaw from Mauer, announced to the world in 1908. Consequently, the announcement of Piltdown Man in 1912 at the Geological Society of London filled a great vacuum. This really did look like the long sought after missing link. But there were some skeptics at that meeting. A professor of anatomy and a dentist, to their eternal credit, said simply that the skull and the jaw could not be of the same creature. The skull was altogether too human and the jaw was much too ape-like. They must have accidentally come together in the gravels. Some people even thought that they could detect a slight difference in the state of preservation of the skull and jaw. What was more, according to the dentist, whose views were not properly respected, the state of wear on the teeth was very odd. You just couldn't get flat wear like that on teeth that appeared to have only just been cut. His shrewd observations were not followed up. There were more finds to come from Piltdown. In 1913, revisiting the pit, Teilhard de Chardin was lucky enough to find an eye tooth, absent in the jaw as found in 1912. He found it in a spread of gravel where Dawson and Smith Woodward had missed it. Curiously enough, it fitted predictions made about it at the 1912 meeting to a T. A unique and extraordinary implement made from a piece of the leg bone of an elephant showed up under a hedge. There is some evidence to suggest that Smith Woodward, Dawson and Tear were not the only people poking around at Piltdown. Miss Mabel Kenwood, now 87 years old, lived in the manor at the time. Dr. Smith Woodward I said, we don't want all the world ding and hunting here till we've had more time to sift all this gravel. So will you keep a watch? Well, one evening I was in our dining room. I looked out of the window and I saw coming across the field, not even up the road, but walking across the field, a very tall man. So extremely nervous, I walked down and said, Excuse me, are you an authorised searcher? The man had a little black bag. He picked up his little black bag with a lot of little tools in it, packed them in, turned round, walked off. He did not utter one single word to me, not one. <laughs> In 1917, Smith Woodward was able to make the spectacular announcement of the finding of the remains of a second Piltdown Man, near Sheffield Park, where there is a station on the famous Bluebell Line. Charles Dawson had died in 1916, but before that, he had told his old friend of his fresh success in finding the bones of another Piltdown Man, a couple of miles from Piltdown. Smith Woodward never learned the exact spot from his ailing friend, and though he visited the place with Dawson before going to France, Teilhard could not afterwards remember the exact circumstances. Even for a number of the former doubting Thomases, this second find clinched it. These must be the remains of two genuine missing links. This was Piltdown Man's finest hour. This utterly bogus and composite monster now took his place in the textbooks. A monolithic memorial to his discovery was set up at Piltdown in 1938. But in time, Piltdown Man's place in the textbooks became increasingly uneasy. His line began to look like a side branch of the family tree of human evolution. 
new finds began to build up a particular picture of human evolution that didn't square with Piltdown at all. From South Africa came the remains of a creature called Australopithecus, whose jaw and teeth were more human in form than Piltdown's, but whose brain was by contrast quite inferior to the human status of the Piltdown brain. The old Java finds were rediscovered and new finds were made. Similar remains came to light in China. This stage of human evolution followed naturally enough upon the South African one. Teeth and jaw were much less ape-like than Piltdown's, but the brain was still inferior in size to modern man's and to Piltdown's brain. Piltdown man was the odd man out, and then in the early 1950s, something happened to change the whole situation. In 1955, an edition of Buried Treasure on BBC television told the story of the scientific debunking of Piltdown Man. In 1949, Dr. Kenneth Oakley of the British Museum of Natural History applied an entirely new method of dating fossils, the fluorine method, to the material from Piltdown. Fluorine is a poisonous element, rather like chlorine, which is absorbed by bones from the water in the soil or subsoil in which they are buried. Fluorine testing can sort out bones which have only been in the ground for a short time, say as a result of a later burial, from bones that have been in the soil long enough to absorb a quantity of the substance. At first, Dr Oakley's results suggested that Piltdown Man was much younger than the animal bones from the site, but then a later test showed a distinct difference between his jaw and skull. This new and more refined fluorine test was not the only indication of a difference between skull and jaw. More samples were taken for other tests. Drilling into the jaw produced a smell of burning like a recent bone. The cranial fragments did not give off a smell of burning at all. The jaw, moreover, yielded little shavings of unstained bone like a recent specimen. The skull fragments gave up fine powder more like a fossil. Once again, a clear distinction between the compositions of jaw and cranium. A test for organic content was carried out. Organic content in the form of nitrogen distilled as ammonia. Once more, the jaw and the cranium showed divergent results. Two separate creatures were indicated. All these new tests were prompted by a suggestion of Dr. J.S. Viner at Oxford. Well, then it occurred to me that one possibility which would explain this extraordinary wear, the single feature, might well be that someone had deliberately placed the parts of the cranium, of a human cranium, with a broken uh, jaw of a modern ape, and had disguised the modernity of this ape by staining it and by abrading, uh, filing the teeth. The jaw was indeed a heavily doctored piece, so was the eye tooth, stuffed with packing and painted with Van Dyke brown. The flint tools were as phony as the jaw and the teeth. In fact, they had been stained in a similar way. The application of acid produced patches through the superficial staining. The animal fossils from Piltdown were an extraordinary collection too. They seem to have been gathered from several exotic locations as well as sites in this country. For example, the extinct elephant tooth that Teo picked up. When tested for radioactivity, this gave an extremely high reading on the dial. In fact, there is only one fossil locality known in the world where a tooth of this sort could originate with such high radioactivity, in Tunisia. It is radioactive enough to speedily expose a piece of photographic paper without a camera. Finally, the skull fragments themselves, which had at first seemed to be possibly genuine fossils of some sort, went down under X-ray crystallography. Minute samples suspended on nylon fibres revealed that the structure of the skull itself had been drastically altered by boiling in an iron sulphate solution. Dr Glyn Daniel summed up. Well, now there you are, skull, jaw, tooth, tools and animal remains, all fraudulent. And who, you ask, was responsible for all this? First of all, have another look at the picture of Dawson. Here it is. Is it the face of a fanatic who would mislead his colleagues so cunningly for so long? 
Or is it the face of an enthusiastic amateur who was hoaxed and misled by some ill-wisher? Perhaps we shall know for certain one day, but perhaps we shall never know. What we do know even now is that by inspiring the development of all these methods of studying fossils, Piltdown Man has been a remarkable stimulus and a benefactor to science. I spoke those words 20 years ago, and in the last 20 years, of course, endless discussion has been going on about the Piltdown controversy, and particularly about who done it. Now, the three people who are in that program who are here again, and Joe Viner, who is now a professor in the University of London, and who was one of the main people who was responsible for the debunking of Piltdown. And here is Kenneth Oakley, recently retired from the British Museum of Natural History, who was the other main protagonist. We are sitting in the geological uh, society where the great meetings took place in 1912 and again in 1953. That meeting in 53 was reported in Science Service in Washington as follows. When the Piltdown hoax was exposed at the meeting of the Geological Society of London, it precipitated a violent discussion. The meeting soon broke up into a series of fist fights. The fracas resulted in the expulsion of uh, several members. Well, that wasn't quite true, but it indicates the interest in the world in what was going on at that time. Now, Kenneth, what new scientific techniques have happened since the debunking that have altered in any way your evaluation of the problem? Um, well, I, I was um, anxious to um, get the um, built-down mandible and cranium um, dated by radiocarbon. Um, in 1953, when we debunked built-down, that wasn't possible because um, techniques then available would have required the destruction of the whole mandible to provide enough carbon yes. to uh, date it by carbon-14. But by 1959, the late Professor de Vries in Groningen, in, in the Netherlands, um, had um, developed a radiocarbon dating technique to such an extent that he was able to um, uh, date um, one gram of bone and um, it was uh, really very exciting I thought because uh, it didn't come out as um, just um, a few years old but as 500 years old plus or minus 100 uh, that's the, the actual determination which um, means uh, a, a date of um, AD 1450 a medieval bone well I went into it and I, I found that, in fact, this uh, date of 500 years old um, made rather good sense insofar as a very large amount of uh, orangutan material um, had been collected and brought over to Great Britain in uh, 1875. And when one examined some of this orangutan material from the Borneo caves, uh, one found um, that the preservation of the bone was very, very similar to the Piltdown mandible. Not in colour, but in texture. The surface of the bone was crackled um, and uh, fissured and so on, uh, and much more porous than, than modern bone is. But um, it is there is a question mark in one's mind as to where it came, was collected by the, by the forger, but it uh, does seem just possible that it was a Natural History Museum collection. No. What about the carbon dating of the cranium? I know that the cranium underwent uh, very severe treatment by boiling, chemical treatment, uh, in, in, in the, in the, in, at the time when the fraud was perpetrated. But uh, has anything happened uh, to change your uh, opinion about the dating, seeing you've had some yes. estimations well, made? Um, Professor, um, the late Professor de Vries did a radiocarbon date on the, the, uh, one of the cranial fragments and got a figure of 620 years, plus or minus 100. Um, I don't think that that um, can be regarded as a very reliable date just because of the very um, um, drastic treatment that the cranial uh, bones had, uh, as you say, boiled uh, in order to uh, stain them um, dark brown and, and so on. One could uh, perhaps easy, easily uh, well uh, estimate that it was well of the order of a thousand years but still recent of course uh, not fossil I mean it could have been a, um, a skull from a Saxon graveyard something like that yeah. we do in fact find that uh, 
a small percentage of uh, crania in, in sacks and graveyards. The, the skeletons do have excessively thick uh, cranial bones for some pathological reason and so on. So that I would say that uh, it was a skull of that order of magnitude that was used for the hoax. And you combine a, a thick skull with an ape jaw and there you've got the uh, ape man. Now, who done it? There are many suspects. In fact, my list is between 13 and 16, and some of them, of course, are quite impossible and hopeless. Just a ridiculous fantasy to put them in the list. But there are three or four people that should be considered. Now, I know that some people firmly believe that it was Smith Woodward, but I can't believe this was so, and I can't believe that a man who, when he retired from the British Museum of Natural History, took up a house near Piltdown so that he could go on excavating there looking for more fragments of bone. Surely nobody in their senses who had perpetrated a hoax or assisted in perpetrating a hoax could have gone in that way. One person that is always mentioned in this is the great uh, Tyard de Chardin. Now, he was certainly in a Jesuit seminary at Hastings during most of the period concerned. He loved Hastings, he called it the Can of England, and he wandered around, he collected fossils, he met Dawson, and curiously enough, on two of the five visits that he was at Piltdown, he found important and interesting things. Whether he put them there, whether they were planted there for him to find, it is curious that they were found on two of his visits. Now, one or two people have been quite convinced that it was Tyre who was responsible. He was known to be a practical joker. But, you know, if you come and analyze the historical facts, if you read his letters, he could not have been the person concerned. He wasn't there until late 1908. He didn't meet Dawson for a whole year, and he was not present at the end. So I really think that Tyre is out. Now, I didn't know him. Many of my friends did, and he was certainly known to Dr. Oakley and Professor Viner. He really does present some difficulties. When I spoke to him in 1954, just before the publication of the book, uh, at that time, uh, he um, was quite firm in his opinion that uh, Dawson couldn't have done it, that it was all some kind of um, accidental bringing together of the material and so on. The more I spoke to him, uh, about those days, the more surprised I was at the way that he, um, if I may put it this way, it was dissociating himself from the whole um, episode, as if he felt uh, really um, troubled by it. Um, and um, I personally feel that sometime in the late 20s or something like that, uh, he may have tumbled to, to the truth of this matter, or at least suddenly mm -hmm. conceived very strong suspicions. And for that reason, uh, that would explain why he was not anxious to write about Piltdown. And he wrote very little about Piltdown from about 1920 uh, onwards. My interpretation, sort of thinking it over very deeply, um, is that um, um, he found it very, very embarrassing to have um, been an unwitting um, agent in the production of the, the the material, the, the canine tooth was found by him, yes. and this was forged, and as a paleontologist, I mean, for him not to have noticed anything funny about it, it must have been very, very, a very sore point with him, and he liked uh, to dismiss the whole thing from his mind. Now, Joe, in 1955, you produced a book published by the Oxford University Press called The Piltdown Forgery, which was described by the Ellery Queen organization, no mean judges in these matters, as the best detective story of the year. Now, most people who read that book thought you had established very clearly who done it. Most people who read that book had gone away thinking you said very clearly that it was done by Charles Dawson. But a more discerning reading of the book shows that you don't say that at all. But you say in a very complicated and delightful sentence on the last page, but one, it is not possible to show that Dawson was not a possible hoaxer. <laughs> now, that got away with it very nicely. Now, what do you think about it today? Well, uh, since uh, I wrote the book, um, I, of course, frequently have gone back to thinking about Dawson's role, and uh, very little in the way of positive evidence uh, incriminating Dawson has really appeared in these 20 years. 
Uh, when I say that, I mean in regard to the pull down forgery itself. The, uh, the various things have come to light which, as in my book, uh, throws li light on uh, Dawson as uh, very likely, uh, the sort of man who would very likely to have uh, done it uh, because of his curious activities in other fields. Um, I uh, felt that it was very necessary in 1955 to be as um, accurate and judicious as possible about the evidence. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why I came to a, not exactly to a non-proven verdict, but as you said, uh, it's been possible to prove that anybody else had done it, that the, the person who was in the right place at the right time, and I think with the right sort of knowledge, and I also think with the right uh, motive, uh, was Charles Dawson. All these things, uh, aspects, have got to be satisfied before uh, anybody can be um, established as the uh, perpetrator. Let me be Angel's advocate for a moment, curious enough. Could Dawson have got hold of the things that were necessary for perpetrating the hoax himself? Could a country solicitor get hold of this fairly old orangutan skull? Yes, I think as far as the, the, the uh, human material is concerned, he should have had very little difficulty. Um, certainly, he had in his possession several skulls. Um, and as he was uh, an assiduous archaeologist and uh, responsible for a number of digs, uh, and in contact with uh, people in, in natural history societies in, in the south of England, uh, no difficulty at all. Uh, I think as far as getting hold of some uh, Anglo-Saxon material, as Kenneth has, has uh, explained. <clears throat> uh, the orangutan jaw, well, as I said in my book, you could actually buy material of the sort from various dealers in those days. Mm -hmm. And of course, one must face it, uh, he was often at the British Museum, and uh, nothing to have stopped him, uh, perhaps uh, persuading somebody there to uh, let him have some material. Uh, and indeed, I, I sometimes wonder whether he didn't have one or two unwitting accomplices of that, of, of that sort in the British Museum. Before I wrote this book and went down to Lewis to make some the inquiries, I had no uh, particular feeling about Dawson or anybody else. They were all just names to me. Um, and I was amazed when I discovered that uh, 40 years before, that's to say 1912, uh, there had been uh, quite a number of people who at that time regarded Dawson with extreme suspicion. In fact, um, uh, I uh, met uh, Mr. Saltzman, who had been president of the local society at Lewis, uh, at a time when we were still doing the final tests. And without telling him that uh, Dr. Oakley and myself, as uh, Sir Wilfred Groh Clark, had come to this uh, conclusion about a fraud forgery, I said I, you know, I was interested in Charles Dawson, and uh, he then taxed me, and I said, well, in fact, uh, if, you don't, uh, if you treat it confidential, as, as confidential information, I don't mind telling you that we think that a forgery has been perpetrated. And he said, well, you don't surprise me. He said, I I've been waiting for 40 years for you to come along and tell me this, mm -hmm. because uh, I've always had my suspicions. So you see, there was quite a on various grounds, not only personal, but uh, in a way technical, uh, the um, uh, evidence against Charles Dawson, circumstantial evidence, uh, remains, I think, very, very, very strong indeed. And I, I think other uh, bits of evidence uh, have been coming along which uh, simply strengthen suspicions against it. Dawson. Well, they certainly have. And in the last uh, 10 years before he died, Salzman kept writing to me as editor of Antiquity, expressing all sorts of uh, suspicions that he had and near proofs that he had. And several people in the last few years have been trying to associate Dawson with the extraordinary business of the forged birds from Hastings, you see. Well, this may not be proof. It may be that if the suspicion attacks itself to one person, that every kind of thing is then attached to him. But recently, uh, I have had some evidence which is very, very exciting indeed. And I'm going to publish it in the next number of Antiquity on the 1st of June. And this is an article by David Peacock, who is a lecturer in archaeology in Southampton. He's been working on the Pevensey uh, tiles for some while. These were things. Three of them were found by Dawson allegedly in excavations, and one was found by Salzmann in his excavations, and they're supposed to prove certain things in literary sources at the end of the history of Roman Britain. Now, by thermoluminescence dating 
Peacock, with the assistance of the Oxford and London laboratories, have shown that these tablets are not as they should be 2,000 years old, but are entirely recent. In fact, they are between the period of 1900 and 1910, when uh, the Piltdown forgeries were happening. <laughs> well, now, <laughs> you can see that if these three forged tablets were put there by Dawson, and if one was put in Saltzman's excavations, you can readily see why Saltzman was so cross if he had suspicions about many things. Now, of course, this I'm sure is a proof. There's no problem about this. Um, if we have proved that Dawson was a forger, I think this uh, casts a slight to darkness of suspicion over his character, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he was the person who perpetrated the Piltdown hoax, does it, Kenneth? No, I don't think so. Um, I think um, I'm very anxious to um, be f um, fair in this matter, mm. that uh, not to sort of load all the blame on to, to Dawson. I, I feel that um, this um, point um, mentioned by you, Joe, that perhaps there were uh, unwitting accomplices and so on, that um, whether unwitting or um, uh, knowing uh, uh, accomplices, that there is some evidence uh, quite strongly suggesting that other people were involved, um, playing in fact a key role um, in the Piltdown hoax. In 1953, when the Legro Clark, uh, Viner, Oakley debunking took place, uh, Professor Movius in Harvard wrote a curious article in, in, in the university paper there saying it can't possibly have been Charles Dawson. I am convinced that it was somebody in the British Museum of Natural History. Now, this was a very extraordinary and alarming thought at the time, and one or two people have thought about it since. And the other day, John Irving, who was a BBC producer until very recently, told me of an interview he had with Martin Hinton in his retirement. Hinton had been Keeper of Zoology in the BM Natural History, and Hinton apparently said to him, well, I know who was the Piltdown hoaxer. I know, but I cannot reveal the name. A man has to die with his secret. And here is a simple fact, and he could obviously not be referring to Dawson. Now, we've all said our pieces, and as you've realized, we haven't all agreed about this, but there is one question. Could this happen again in the same sort of contexts? Well, I don't think it could, because when Piltdown Man was found, it was an isolated fossil. Now we have hundreds of fossil men from all over the world, and there is the record against which to match any new find. But secondly, now there are all these scientific techniques that can be applied to any new find, and the interesting thing is that they have come into existence and been developed because of the debunking of Piltdown Man.